Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show, brought to you by the Jacksonville Historical Society and Comcast. Our show is here every Wednesday night at 8. I'm Harry Reagan. Later on our show, Emily Liska will focus on a day of violent racial tension known as Axe Handle Saturday. But first, we join the Jacksonville Transportation Authority in celebrating the JTA's 50th anniversary. Our guest is Michael Blaylock, Executive Director and CEO of JTA. Welcome, Michael. My pleasure. Uh, JTA uh, actually, I guess, dates its uh, birth from 1955. That's correct. Before 1955, there was uh, an expressway authority, That's correct. Jacksonville Expressway Authority. That's correct. And uh, someone had the very good idea to uh, combine building roads and mass transportation. Because in a lot of places, they compete with each other, don't they? That's true. That's true. And I think what we have is a very unique uh, opportunity to blend all of the resources together. You know, so it has worked out uh, very well, and uh, you were telling me before the show that a lot of cities don't do this. This no, is fairly uh, unique. It's very unique. We're one of three that I'm aware of that actually provides public transport uh, and transportation of the road system, design mm -hmm. and construction of the road system. And so that's, that's pretty unique. And for Jacksonville, that's, that's a nice attribute to have. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some photos, Michael. Um, some from the Historical Society archives and some from your archives. Okay. And the first one is uh, way before the Jacksonville Transportation Authority came along. This might be one of the very first uh, forms of mass transportation. Believe it or not, this is a, an 1898 school bus, I'm told. <laughs> so uh, uh, horse-drawn, we shouldn't forget that uh, horses played an important role in transportation before streetcars, before buses, before the Skyway, et cetera. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, and the next one, if we can go on to the next one, is a very important form of uh, mass transportation that was around for years and years, the streetcar. Mm -hmm. That's a famous photo, uh, the streetcar on Main Street. But streetcars ran all over the city. Oh, absolutely. And then the next one is uh, uh, an important event in 1936, side by side, uh, the day the streetcars went out of business and the buses started. So there they are as the kind of uh, crossing paths and uh, that's from that day forward, I guess there were just buses. Now buses have come a long way mm -hmm. since that's then. True. That's, true. that's quite a, a transition there. And the, the early buses were not uh, municipal buses in, in a lot of cases. They were privately owned uh, privately bus owned, systems. Uh, and, and very difficult to drive. They had no power steering. Uh, no air conditioning. Yeah. So it was it was quite a transition. Not much fun for the bus driver or the Not passengers. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. And uh, I guess the uh, one of the things that happened was bus systems became less and less profitable as people turned to private automobiles for transportation, and it became hard for a priv for pr private enterprise to make a go of it. Well, I think w with the uh, proliferation of of the automobile industry and the uh, creation of the interstate highway systems, uh, all those roads and connections to those cities really made it very marketable for the automobile. So um, the local transit systems or privately owned companies could not remain competitive, you know, in those communities. And there, uh, I guess, <coughs> uh, people had to bite the bullet and realize that mass transit probably was not going to be a profit making operation. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was going to require some subsidy. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's essentially what happened. A lot of the cities across the country purchase uh, the assets of those private companies. And that, and that's what happened here. Right. In Jacksonville mm -hmm. in 1972 and uh, took responsibility for providing service. Well, uh, as we said, before the Transportation Authority, there was the Expressway Authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people uh, may not realize that Jacksonville kind of had, got a head start in terms of uh, expressways by taking the initiative on its own rather than waiting for the state and federal government to... Well, that's true. And I think we kind of remain in that same position today, being in Northeast Florida, uh, competing against South Florida. Uh, the St. John River created a lot of challenges for us. Yes. And I think the visionaries saw at that time that in order to connect our communities, we really needed to have some bridge crossings. So the introduction of the toll facilities uh, were, were put in place at that point, you know, as an opportunity to finance our road building. Okay, and speaking of bridges, uh, we've, we've seen a couple of bridges as you were talking. This is uh, 
one of the important bridges. The I guess this is the Matthews Bridge. Yes, yes. And I think we place. saw the Fuller Warren Bridge. Uh, and the, uh, the, there's the Fuller Warren Bridge. Yes. Fuller Warren Bridge was an, an important and uh, kind of interesting bridge because it, it, it included an interstate highway. Yeah. yeah. So you don't see local government going no, ahead and building don't. a bridge that's part of the interstate highway. Yeah, not, but you know, it was a part of the original design back in the early days of the Expressway Authority. Mm -hmm. they, they actually laid out the interstate system, you know, as you see it in Jacksonville today. And so with the interstate funding uh, becoming available, it was just a way to get it financed, get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, well, s some people who haven't been here for a while may not know that most of these bridges were financed in large part by uh, the T word, the, the tolls. T -word, the toll word, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so uh, if, uh, Jacksonville got a reputation for years and years, I guess, if with interstate traffic, if you were taking I-95, you had to stop and pay a toll on the Fuller Warren right. Bridge. Well, you know, the good news about that is that we were able to get yeah. ahead of the curve. And those toll revenues not only built uh, the Fuller Warren, but you've got the Hot Expressway system and the Butler Boulevard corridor. Uh, so it's, it's had this impact uh, in this community. Now, the, one of the newer bridges we can take a look at is uh, the Dames Point Bridge. And there's a beautiful picture here, I think, if we can get it, uh, a nighttime picture. That's a magnificent bridge. It is. It is considered one of our landmarks, uh, one of our key landmarks for our city. It's very beautiful at night. And speaking of landmarks, uh, a landmark that firmly established itself with uh, Super Bowl XXXIX mm -hmm. last year, 39, uh, is the Main Street Bridge. Yeah. And it became a, a major part of the, we're going to take a look at a picture of it in a moment. Uh, it became a major part of the uh, of the city's skyline, and, and w when you went to Super well, Bowl coverage, you saw that Main Street Bridge. I can tell you, uh, Harry, that the calls are still coming in today about the attractiveness of those lighted bridges. The lighted bridges, right. And the difference it makes on our waterfront, and I think that's one of the best decisions we could have made. Uh, the mayor was very helpful in getting that done. So it's, it's a nice uh, attribute for our city. The lighted bridges, and along with the uh, w w one of the most uh, fabulous fireworks demonstrations yeah. I've ever seen. The yeah, it was Super, fun. Super Bowl in Jacksonville. It was fun. It was fun. Actually, I had a lady call the other day and said that the, uh, she thought that the bridges brought uh, romance to the city. Yes. I thought that was interesting. That's the first time I heard that one. Not something that, the, that, that <laughs> someone might uh, think of if you're waiting for a boat to go through uh, the Main Street <laughs> yeah. Bridge. But yeah, that's true. Not, not romantic at that that's particular true. time. But uh, let's take the, uh, now an, an important part in history is go we're going to take a look now. Speaking of bridges and tolls, there's uh, the, ter the tolls were uh, abolished by a vote of the people. Yes. And replaced by a half cent sales tax. That's right. 1988, that was the end of tolls in Jacksonville. And you, you can see the wrecking ball. I'm not sure which bridge that is. It might be the Matthews. Okay. But, uh, and all of a sudden, you could go uh, over the bridges without stopping to pay a That's toll. That's true. That's true. That's kind of a, an amazing thing, isn't it, when you think about it, that people actually voted uh, a half cent sales tax, some of whom probably weren't paying tolls. Well, I think the good news about that is that there were a host of services that were provided. Uh, you were opening up the bridges to uh, allow more free flow, and along with that, you had other projects that were financed as a part of that, that had to sales tax. So um, it, it was, it was, I think it was the right decision to make mm -hmm. at that time. It's just uh, getting people to vote for a tax is uh, yeah. not easy. But, I, you know, my belief is if, if you explain yeah. and you keep your word in terms of what you're going to deliver, I think the voters will come through. Well, there's another uh, example of that with Better Jacksonville, yeah. where people, again, voted for yet another half-cent sales tax. And I think that's uh, a lot of which in, a lot of it included transportation projects. That's true. It's a large part of that is, is transportation. That that was a, a real exceptional uh, exceptional mm -hmm. uh, position uh, for the public to take. So uh, it's got a matron of all kind of services from libraries. You know that you know the whole gamut of services that's a part of that. And uh, again, I think it, it's, as soon as we can deliver those goods, I think the public's going to feel pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody sees the JTA uh, very visibly with buses and so forth, but they may not know where you're located. Uh, I wanted to show a picture uh, okay. uh, because you're down there on Myrtle Street, and a lot of people may not uh, drive by there, but okay. it's uh, it's an in interesting place. Uh, that's that's where all the buses are parked when that's they're correct. not uh, in the streets of Jacksonville. That's correct. 
That's correct. And uh, th we, there's the aerial view of the, uh, and that has turned out to be a g very uh, practical, useful, uh, efficient yeah, it's facility. Yeah, it's strategic for now, but in the future we're going to have to, you know, establish, you know, satellite facilities, mm -hmm. you know, because of our large land area. And uh, w we saw a picture just a moment ago. Let's go back and take a look at that a trolley. Uh, that's now you might look at that trolley and wonder whether that's an old trolley or a new trolley, mm -hmm. uh, because the new trolleys look like. That's the true. old trolleys, don't That's they? True. That's true. The, the, the dead giveaway is the Skyway station behind it, exactly. so you know that it's exactly. a, a new trolley. Exactly. How, how have the trolleys worked out? Uh, it worked out really fine. I mean, the long-term plan for the trolley is that they become the mainstay, you know, for where the Skyway does not travel downtown. So it'll be able to provide, you know, nighttime uh, transport for persons, you know, attending the, uh, the landing or the fine arts center and there's the Skyway. The Skyway. So we have definite plans for the trolley in the future. And uh, the Skyway is, uh, will there be any additional, uh, any additions to the Skyway or is it basically uh, completed? Our desire would be that we could extend the Skyway to the stadium area. Ah. Uh, that would be our first desire. Uh, but what we're going to try to do now is to try to take the trolley and utilize the trolley as an extension mm -hmm. uh, of the Skyway system until we get the full development downtown that we foresee in the future. And I have one more picture that I want to uh, show. The, uh, there's been a lot of talk about it because we've got this fantastic natural asset, the St. John's River, not to mention some of the tributaries. And uh, could we someday make use of uh, the river as a m means of transportation? Absolutely. With something like this? Absolutely. Well, you know, you made the point earlier about uh, steamboat travel. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to go back from where we started. And I think that St. John River poses a real opportunity uh, for us to research to see how we might be able to make ferry technology work uh, on that river. Well, it, it's a history show, but we want to talk a little bit about the future. Okay. And I'm not going to ask you to uh, project too far. Uh, the, the 100th anniversary of the JTA, assuming it's still around, would be uh, 2055. Yeah. But for the next 10 or 20 or 25 years, uh, what, what would you be focusing on at the JTA? Well, I think the point about the, uh, the ferry technology, I, I think that, that could be a very much part of what we provide the community with in terms of the likelihood of making that service happen. So we're going to be launching a study uh, this summer mm -hmm. uh, looking at the feasibility of waterborne transportation. Uh, I also see the use of the rail system, commuter rail, uh, from the adjoining counties, uh, St. John County, um, Fernandina, uh, Clay County, Putnam County, we think there are some real opportunities where we might be able to work with the railroads uh, in terms of shared right away. Uh, we've got a while before we get to that point, but we think that's a real opportunity uh, to give people another mobility option. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're going to continue to build roads. Uh, you'll see other bridge crossings. Uh, I think what we're really trying to achieve is what we call a mobile Northeast Florida region, uh, where uh, persons living in this region will have choices. Everybody's not going to get out of their car and get onto a public transport. So we think there's a market for the different modes. And I think it's our job to determine what that market is and then how we can capture that market. Because the, <clears throat> in the early uh, days of transportation, mass transportation, people used it because they had no choice. That's true. Now uh, most people do have a choice uh, and so the idea is to try to get them to use it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, Harry, if we strategically design it right, people will, will, will take advantage of it. Michael Blaylock, thank you very much for being with us on the Jacksonville History Show. Been my pleasure. And coming next, Emily Liska on Axe Handle Saturday.